would from their hiding places look upon one of the strangest sights that had ever greeted human eyes so rapid had been the advance of these mighty masses of ice crashing against the mountain sides and rending the very rocks in their fury that the air gave up its warmth and the sun was powerless to give it back again the animals of the wild wood and the beasts of the field overtaken in their flight perished as they ran and stood there stark and stiff with heads uptossed and muscles knotted then by the thousands and ten times thousands the crushed crystals of the pursuing floods caught up like moss and leaves in a mountain torrent and packed in every cave and cavern on the way tearing broader and loftier portals into these subterranean chambers so that they might do their work the better and these then o bullibrain are your meat quarries i exclaimed whence ye draw your daily food even so little baron replied the hot-headed coltycorp and not only our food but the skins which serve us so admirably for clothing in this cold underground world and the oil too which burns in our beautiful alabaster lamps besides a hundred other things such as bone for hues and handles horn for needles and buttons and eating utensils wool for the weaving of our undergarments and magnificent pelts of bear and seal and walrus which laid upon our benches and divans of crystal ice transform them into beds and couches which even an inhabitant of thy world might envy but o bullibrain i cried out have ye not almost exhausted these supplies will not death from starvation soon stare ye all in the face in these deep and icy caverns of the underworld visited by the sun's light yet unwarmed by it nay little baron answered bullibrain with a smile almost as warm as one of my own let not that thought give thee a moment's alarm for we have as yet barely raised the lid of this ice-box of nature's packing we are not large eaters anyway continued lord hothead for while it is true that we are not indolent people for his frigid majesty's palace and our dwellings need constant repair and new hatchets and axes must be chipped out in the flint quarries and new lamps carved and new garments woven yet it is also true that we take life rather easy we have no enemies to slay no quarrels to settle no gold to fight over no land to drive our fellow creatures from and fence in nor can we be ill if we were willing to be for in this pure cold crisp air disease would try in vain to sow her poison germs hence needing no doctors we have none as we have no lawyers either or merchants to sell us what belongs to us already his frigid majesty is an excellent king i never read of a better one i doubt that his like exists in the upper world always cool-headed no thought of conquest no dreams of power no longings for empty pomp and show ever enter his mind since the day his father died and we set the great coltycorp crown of crystal ice upon his cool brow his temperature has never risen but half a degree and that was only for a brief hour or so and was occasioned by a mad proposal of one of his counsellors who claimed that he had discovered an explosive compound something like the gunpowder of thy world i fancy by which he could shatter the glorious window of rock crystal set in the mountain dome of our underworld and let in the warm sunshine did his frigid majesty gelidus put this daring coltycorp to death i asked oh dear no replied bullibrain he merely ordered him to be refrigerated for so many hours a day until all his feverish projects had been chilled to death for no doubt little baron a man of thy deep learning knows full well that all the ills which thy world suffers from are the children of fevered brains of minds made restless and visionary by the high temperature of the blood which gallops through the approaches to the dome of thought stirring up wild dreams and visions as thy son lifts the poisonous vapour from the stagnant pool the more i listened to bullibrain the more i liked him the fact of the matter is 
i preferred to sit in his narrow cell with its plain walls of ice lighted up by a single alabaster lamp and converse with him to loitering in the splendid throne-room of his frigid majesty king gelidus but bulger had discovered that the pelts of princess schneeboule's divan were much thicker softer and warmer than the single one allowed lord hothead and therefore he preferred spending his time with her but fearing lest he might get into mischief i didn't dare to leave him alone with the princess for too long at a time End of chapter 23chapter twenty four of baron trump's marvellous underground journey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state baron trump's marvellous underground journey by ingersoll lockwood chapter twenty four some few things concerning the dear little princess schneeboule how she and i became fast friends and how one day she conducted bulger and me into her favourite grotto to see the little man with the frozen smile something about him what came of my having looked upon him quite fully described at the time of bulger's and my arrival in the land of the colty corpse the princess schneeboule was about fifteen years of age and i must say that rarely had it been my good fortune to make the acquaintance of such a sweet-tempered lovable little creature she flitted about the ice palace like a beam of sunlight and there was nothing of the spoiled child about her although a bit mischievous at times her voice was as full of music as a skylark's and it was not many days before she and i had become the best of friends in the world now you must know dear friends that according to the law of the colty corpse a princess is left absolutely free to choose her own husband and his frigid majesty was very anxious that schneeboule should pick hers out as soon as possible moreover the law of the land gave her perfect freedom to choose a husband of high or low degree provided he was young enough the way in which a colty court princess was required to make known her preference was to press a kiss upon the cheek of the young man whom she might settle upon this ennobled him at once and he became the heir apparent to the throne of ice and entitled to sit on its steps until he should be crowned king now his frigid majesty was delighted to see this friendship spring up between schneeboule and me for he had hoped to make use of my influence to bring her to set the necessary kiss on some youth's cheek before i took my departure from the cold kingdom of the colty corpse i gave him the word of a nobleman that i would do my best to carry out his wishes with schneeboule for a guide bulger and i often went for walks through the splendid ice grottoes of her father's kingdom selecting days when the sunlight of the outer world poured strongest through the mighty lens set in the departure from the cold kingdom of the colty corpse i gave him the word of a nobleman that i would do my best to carry out his wishes with schneeboule for a guide bulger and i often went for walks through the splendid ice grottoes of her father's kingdom selecting days when the sunlight of the outer world poured strongest through the mighty lens set in the side of the mountain then these grottoes took on a splendor that my poor tongue is powerless to describe their crystal mazes glittered as if their walls were set with massive jewels most wonderfully cut and polished and as if their ceilings were fretted with gems so peerless that all the gold of the upper world would fall far short of paying for them here there and everywhere the skill of the colty corpse had carved and chiseled graceful flights of steps broad landings with majestic columns and winding corridors lined with long rows of statues single and groupwise and ever and anon the visitor came upon a terrace where seated upon a fur-covered divan he might look out upon the bewildering beauty of king gelidus's icy domains arch touching arch and dome springing from dome while over and above all through the gigantic lens in its granite setting a mile above our heads streamed a flood of glorious sunlight 
lighting up this world within a world with a radiance so grand and so complete as to seem to be a sun of a far greater splendor than the one that warmed the upper world and bathed it in so many gorgeous hues at morn and eve. Hardly a day went by now that the princess of the Pulte Corpse did not surprise either Bulger or me with some gift or other. To tell the truth, dear friends, although my Russian coat was fur trimmed, yet I began to feel the need of warmer garments after a week's sojourn in the icy domain of King Gelidus, and I think Schneeboule must have heard my teeth chattering, for one morning upon entering the Palace of Ice, I was delighted to be presented with a full suit of fur precisely similar to the one worn by King Gelidus himself. Nor was Bulger forgotten by the loving little princess, for with her own hands she had knitted him a blanket of the softest wool, which she belted so snugly around his body and tied so tightly around his neck that henceforth he felt perfectly comfortable in the chill air of the home of the cult horse. One day the princess Schneeboule said to me, Oh, come, little baron, come to my favorite grotto. Now that the sun's rays are bright within it, there shall thou see a wonder. A wonder? Princess Schneeboule? Yes, little baron, a wonder, she repeated. The little man with the frozen smile. Little man with the frozen smile? I echoed. Come and see, come and see, little baron, cried Schneeboule, hurrying on ahead. In a few moments we had reached the grotto and bounded into it with the princess leading the way. Suddenly she halted in front of a magnificent block of crystal ice, clear as polished glass, and cried out, There! Look! There is the little man with the frozen smile! Even now, as the thought of that moment comes over me, I feel something of the thrill of half fear, half joy, as my eyes fell upon the little creature shut in that superb block of ice himself a part of it, himself its heart, its contents, its mystery. There in its center, in easy posture, with wide open eyes, and with what might be called a smile upon his face, that is a glint of kindliness and affection in its strange eyes, with their overhanging brows, sat a small animal of the chimpanzee race. He had possibly been asleep when the icy flood struck him, dreaming of beautiful trees bending beneath purple fruit of cloudless skies above and a coral beach below and death had come to him so quickly that he had become a brother to this block of ice while the happy dream was still in his thoughts it was wonderful it was more than wonderful spellbound by the strange spectacle i stood there i know not how long with my eyes looking into his at last Schneeboule's voice aroused me. Ha-ha! she laughed. Look, little baron, Bulger's trying to kiss his poor dead brother. In truth, Bulger did have his nose pressed firmly against the block of ice in his effort to scent the strange animal imprisoned in that crystal cell, so near and yet so far beyond the reach of his keen scent. Well, little baron, cried Schneeboule, did I not speak truly? Have I not shown you the little man with the frozen smile? Indeed, thou hast, fair princess, was my reply, and I cannot tell thee how grateful I am to thee for having done so. Then, as she plucked me by the sleeve, I pleaded, Nay, gentle Schneeboule, not yet, not yet, let me bide a little longer. The little man with the frozen smile seems to beg me not to go. I can almost imagine that I hear him whisper, Oh, little baron, Break open the crystal cell of my prison and take me with thee back to the world of sunshine, back to the land of the orange tree, where the soft warm winds use to rock me to sleep in the cradle of the swaying boughs, while a wise and watchful patriarch of our flock stood guard over us all. Schneeboule's big round gray eyes filled with tears at these words. Would that he were alive, little baron, she murmured and that I could give him some of my happiness to pay him back for all the long years he has been spending in his icy prison. In a few moments, Schneeboule took me by the hand and led me away from the great block of ice with its silent prisoner. My heart was very heavy, and both Schneeboule and Bulger did their utmost to divert me, but all to no purpose. 
Leaving the princess at the portal of the palace, I went to my dwelling, which was ablaze with the soft glow of its alabaster lamps, and there I found a beautiful new pelt spread over my divan, a new gift from King Gelidus, but I could take no pleasure in it. My thoughts were all with the little man, with a frozen smile, locked in the icy embrace of that crystal mold, which, in its cold irony, let him seem to be so free and unfettered, and yet held him in such vice-like grip. After a while I dismissed my serving people and laid me down for the night, with my dear Bulger nestled against my breast. But I could not sleep. All night long, those strange eyes with their uncanny glint followed me about, pleading strong but silent for me to come again, for me to soften my heart like a child of the sunshine that I was, to shatter his crystal dungeon and set him loose, to bear him away from the icy domain of the cultic works, out into the warm air of the upper world. What was I dreaming about? Was he not dead? Had not his spirit left his body thousands and thousands of years ago? Why should I let such wild thoughts vex my mind? What good would come of it? None. None whatsoever. I was a reasonable creature. I must not give lodgment within my brain to such silly ideas. The little man with a frozen smile had been, through almost playful fate, laid away in a beautiful tomb. I must not disturb it. No doubt in his lifetime he had been the pet of a noble manor, brought to the Northland from some sunny clime by master of powerful argosy. Let him rest in peace. I must not dare to mar the beauty of his crystal tomb, so gloriously transparent. I was even sorry that Schneeboule had led me into her beautiful grotto and resolved to go thither no more. What poor weak creatures we are, so fertile in good resolutions and yet so unfruitful of results, planting whole acres with fair promises, but when the tender shoots pierce the ground, turning our back upon the crop as if it didn't belong to us. End of chapter 24《25 of Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M.B. in Washington State. Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood. Chapter 25 A Sleepless Night for Bulger and Me and What Followed It interview with king gelidus my request and his reply what all took place when i learned that the king and his counselors had decided not to grant my request strange tumult among the colty quirks and how his frigid majesty stilled it and some other things not only had i been unable to sleep but by my tossing about i had kept poor dear bulger awake so that when morning came we both looked haggard enough I felt as if I had been through a fit of sickness, and no doubt he did too. At any rate, I had no appetite for the heavy meat diet of the colded corpse, and seeing me refuse my breakfast, Bulger did likewise. I had promised Schneeboule to come early to the palace, for she had a number of questions which she wished to ask me concerning the upper world. "'Good morning, little baron,' she cried in her sweetest tones as I entered the throne room. Did sleep well last night on the new pelt which Papa sent thee? I was about to make a reply when Schneeboule's hand, coming in contact with mine, for we had both removed our gloves in order to shake hands, she uttered a piercing scream, and drawing back stood there blowing her breath on her right palm as she exclaimed again and again, Firebrand! Firebrand! In an instant, King Gelidus and a group of his counselors drew near and pulling over their gloves one after the other laid his hand in mine glowing coals cried his frigid majesty tongue of flame roared frosty fizz boiling water groaned glacier boy red hot hissed icicle thou must leave the palace at once 
half pleaded King Gelidus. It would simply be madness for me to permit such a firebrand to remain within the walls of the royal residence. The intense heat of thy body would be sure to melt the hole in its wall ere the sun goes down. The royal councillors again drew off their gloves and laid hands upon poor Bulger when a second alarm even wilder than the first was sent up and we were hastily escorted back to our lodging house. No doubt, dear friends, you will be somewhat mystified upon reading these words, but the explanation is easy. Owing to worriment and lack of sleep, Bulger and I had awakened in a highly feverish condition, and to the Colty corpse we had really seemed to be almost on fire. But our fever left us toward night, hearing which King Gilidus sent for us and did all in his power to entertain us with song and dance, in both of which Sneemule was very skilled. Finding that his frigid majesty was in such a rosy humor, if I may be allowed to speak that way of a person whose face was almost as white as the alabaster lamps over his head, I determined to ask him for permission to cleave asunder the icy cell of the little man with the frozen smile, and ascertain, if possible, from the collar, which, made up apparently of gold and silver coin, was clasped around his neck, to whom he had belonged and where his home had been. No sooner had I preferred my request than I noticed that the white face of the royal Gelidus parted with its smile and took on a terribly icy look. Methought I could look through the tip of his nose as though an icicle, and methought too that his ears shone in the light of the alabaster lamps like sheets of crystal ice, and that his voice as he spoke puffed into my face like the first flakes of a coming snowstorm. I quickly repented me of my rash action, but it was too late and I determined to stand by it. Little Baron, spoke Royal Gelidus in icy tones, never a heart beat in a kingly breast that was purer and colder than mine, freer from the warmth of selfishness, with not a single hot corner for its ire or anger to nestle in, or for weakness or folly to make their hiding places. For thousands of years my people have inhabited this icy domain, and breathed this pure cold air, and never yet hath one desired to strike an axe of flint into the walls of that crystal prison. However, little baron, there may be some warm corner in my heart wherein cold and limpid wisdom may not be at home. Therefore, come to me tomorrow for my answer. Meanwhile, I'll take counsel with the coolest brains and coldest hearts about me. If they see no harm in thy request, thou mayest crack open the crystal gates that have for so many centuries shut the man-like creature in his silent cell, and take him forth in order to study the mystic words graven on his collar, but upon the strict condition that in cleaving open his house of crystal my quarrymen so apply their wedges of flint as to break the block into two equal pieces, that when thou hast read what may be there, the two parts be closed upon the little man again, edge fitting edge like a perfect mold, so exactly that to the eye no sign of line or joint be visible. Dost promise, little baron, that this shall be as to our royal will it seems meet that it should be? I promised most solemnly that the crystal cell of the little man with the frozen smile should be opened and closed exactly as his frigid majesty had directed. It would be hard for me to tell you, dear friends, how happy I went to rest that night upon my icy divan, and how, as the tiny flame of my alabaster lamp shed its soft glow upon the walls of ice, I lay there turning over in my mind the strange and mysterious pleasure which was soon to fall to my lot when the quarrymen of King Gelidus should send their wedges of flint in this glorious block of ice and cleave it asunder. Even Don Fum, Master of Masters had never dreamed of receiving a message from the people who lived in the very childhood of the world, and in anticipation already I enjoyed the splendid triumph which would be mine when I came to lecture before the learned societies upon the mysterious lettering on the curious collar clasping the neck of the little man with the frozen smile. Imagine my anguish then, dear friends, upon receiving a message from King Gelidus the next day that his counselors had with one voice decreed against the opening of the crystal prison, 
which stood in Schneeboule's grotto. I was as if smitten with some sudden and awful ailment. I had never felt until that moment how keen the tooth of disappointment could be. I shivered first with a chill that made me brother to the Colty corpse, and then I burned with a fever so raging that a wild rumor spread through Gelidus's icy domain that I was setting fire to the very walls and roof. With wild outcries and faces drawn with nameless dread, the subjects of his frigid majesty rushed pell-mell up the wide flights of stairs leading to the palace of ice, and pleaded for the king to show himself. In cold and frigid majesty, Gelidus walked out upon the platform and listened to the prayers of his people. "'We shall burn!' they cried. "'Our beautiful homes will fall about our ears. These crystal steps will melt away, and all these fair columns and arches and statues and pedestals will turn to water and empty themselves into the lower caverns of the earth. The great window of our sky will fall with awful crash upon our heads, putting an end forever to this fair domain of crystal splendor. O oh, Gelidus, haste thee, haste thee, ere it be too late. Let the little baron have his way before bitter disappointment transforms his body and limbs into tongues of flame to lick up this magnificent palace in a single night and dash its thousand alabaster lamps to the ground, a heap of shards no fragment matching its brother fragment but all a wretched mass of worthless matter king gelidus and his frosty counsellors saw that it would be useless to attempt to reason with the people and therefore turning toward them he coldly waved his chilly right hand and with an icy smile spoke frostily as follows go colty corpse to your homes and be happy what think you, have I a heated brain? Doth my heart steam with foolishness? That you should think me capable of wishing harm to the tiniest Colty Corp that spins his top of ice in my fair kingdom. Go to your homes, I say. The little baron is already cooling off, for he hath my full consent to cleave asunder the crystal prison of the little man with a frozen smile. There is nothing to be frightened about, my children. So eat hearty suppers and sleep soundly tonight, for my royal word for it. By tomorrow morning, the little baron will cease to be the least bit dangerous to the peace and welfare of our icy kingdom. A good cold night to you all. In a short half hour, the panic stricken Colty corpse were all back in their homes again, and when a messenger came from King Delidus to measure my temperature, he found such a great improvement that he opened his chilly heart and sent me a beautiful present from his treasure house, to wit, a small block of ice, clearer than any gem I had ever seen, in the heart of which lay a glorious red rose in fullest bloom, each velvet pebble opened out eagerly. Upon consulting my diary, I had found that it was just six months to a day since I had left Castle Trump and the loved ones sheltered by its time-worn tiles and cold as was the covering of this thrice beautiful child of the upper world i clasped it to my breast and shed tears and this was the way it came about dear friends that king gelidus and his frosty counselors were brought to give their consent to my cleaving asunder the icy prison wherein lay the little man with the frozen smile end of chapter twenty five Chapter 26 of Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State, Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood. Chapter 26 How the Quarry Men King Gelidus cleft asunder the crystal prison of the little man with the frozen smile. My bitter disappointment in how I bore it. Wonderful happenings of the night that followed. Bulger again proves himself to be an animal of extraordinary sagacity. Bulger and I had little appetite for the dainty breakfast of stewed sweetbreads which the Colty Corpse set before us the next morning. For I knew, and he half suspected, that 
something important was going to happen, being nothing less than the cleaving asunder of the crystal cell which had held the little chimpanzee prisoner for so many centuries. Walking beside the merry princess Schneebule, who was delighted to know that his frigid majesty, her father, had at last yielded to my wishes, Bulger and I set out for the beautiful ice grotto. Behind us walked Frosty Fizz and Leisure Boy, with instructions from the king to supervise the cleaving asunder of the block of ice. And after them came four of King Gelidus's quarrymen, two bearing flint axes with helves of polished bone, and two carrying the flint wedges to be used in the work. We soon entered Schneebule's grotto, and the task was at once entered upon. It seemed to me I could almost see the little man with the frozen smile wink his eyelids as the quarrymen set their wedges in place and began to mark the line of fracture. But of course, dear friends, you know what imagination I have, especially when I get worked up over anything. So you must take what I say sometimes with a grain of salt, although, as a rule, you may accept my statements with childlike confidence. With such wonderful skill did the Colty Corpian quarrymen use their axes and wedges that in a few moments, to my great delight, the huge block of ice fell asunder in perfect halves, in one of which the little man-like creature lay on his side like a casting in a mold. I made haste to lift him out and wrap him in a soft pelt, which I had brought along for that purpose, and then I turned to retrace my steps to my chamber, where I intended to begin at once my study of whatever inscription should be found upon his curious collar. Remember, little baron, said Glacier Boy, by express command of his frigid majesty, the little man with the frozen smile must be returned to his crystal cell tomorrow morning at this very hour. I bowed assent, and then, having accompanied Princess Schneebule as far as the bottom of the grand staircase leading to the ice palace, I turned away and was soon in the privacy of my own apartment. Now came for me one of the bitterest disappointments of my life, but I submitted with a good grace, for it was fit punishment visited upon me for my foolish vanity in striving to unearth some older record of the human race than had yet been done by any of the great searchers and philosophers, not even excepting that master of masters, Don Strefalo Fijiguanarius Fum. Know then, dear friends, that the quaint collar, made up of gold and silver coins or discs, cunningly linked together, which encircled the animal's neck, contained not a single word or letter of any language, the undersides being quite blank, and the upper merely having rough carved outlines of an object which might possibly have been intended for the sun. Wrapping the animal up in the soft pelt, I laid him away in the corner of my divan, and betook myself to the palace of his frigid majesty, where I frankly informed King Gelidus of my great disappointment in not finding some few words, or even a single word, of a language unknown to the wisest heads of the upper world. Schneebule was so touched by my sadness that had I not skillfully kept out of her way, I verily believe she would have thrown her arms around my neck and imprinted upon my cheek the kiss which would have made me the king of the Colty Corpse. But I had no longing to spend the rest of my life in the icy domains of his frigid majesty, even though my brow would be crowned with the cold crown of the Colty Corpse. If I had been an old man, with slow and feeble pulse, it would have been very different, but my heart was too warm and my blood too hot to fill such a position with agreeableness to myself, or satisfaction to the people of this icy underworld. So I kept the little princess busy enough, I can assure you, first with songs, then with dance, and then with storytelling. That night King Gelidus ordered a magnificent fete to be held in my honor. Five hundred more alabaster lamps were lighted, and the royal divans were laid with the richest pelts in the palace, and after the dancing and singing had ended, frozen tidbits from the royal kitchen were passed around on alabaster salvers, and Bulger and I ate until our teeth ached. It was late when we reached our own apartment, and so full were my thoughts of the beautiful sights which we had gazed upon in the throne room that I had quite forgotten about the poor little man with the frozen smile, whom I had covered up and tucked away on my divan. 
but bulger had not been so hard-hearted twenty times during the evening he had given me a sly tug at my sleeve as much as to say come little master let's hurry back just not remember that we left my poor little frozen brother tucked away in that icy chamber all alone by himself i was very weary and i fell off to sleep almost immediately and yet i had an indistinct recollection that bulger was not in his place against my breast i remembered feeling for him but that's all it never flashed upon me that he had gone and lain down beside the poor little stranger whom i had so unfeelingly lifted from his last resting place and yet such must have been the case for about midnight it seemed to me i was awakened by a gentle tugging at my sleeve it was my faithful bulger but half awake and half asleep as i was i merely thought that he was only asking for a caress as was often his wont when he fell a thinking about home so i reached out and stroked his head several times and dropped off again but the tugging began anew and this time it was more vigorous and with it came an impatient whine which meant come cut me little master rouse thee dost suppose i would break thy rest unless there was good reason for it i didn't need a third reminder but with a single bound landed on my feet and reaching out for one of the tiny tapers which the culty corpse make use of as lighters i carried the flames from the single lamp burning on the wall to the three others hanging here and there the icy walls of my chamber were now ablaze with light there sat bulger on the fur-covered divan beside the place where the little man with the frozen smile lay hidden under the pelt his tail was wagging nervously and his large lustrous eyes were fixed first upon me and then upon the covering of his dead brother with an expression i never remembered having seen in them before and then with a sudden movement he laid hold of the pelt and drawing it aside showed me what think you dear friends what i ask in a tone of half whisper half gasp for now years after i still can feel that wonderful thrill which i felt then why it was alive that ape-like creature had come to life after his sleep of thousands of years in that narrow crystal cell bulger had lain down beside his frozen brother and warmed him back to life again oh it was wondrously wonderful to see that pair of little eyes bead-like in brightness look up and blink at me and then to hear that low moaning voice so human-like as if it whimpered with a shake and a shiver oh how cold it is how very cold it is where's the sun where's the soft warm wind and where are the cloudless skies so blue oh so beautifully blue they used to hang over my head bidding bulger to lie down again beside him and snuggle up as close as possible i made haste to cover them both with the softest skins i could find in a few moments there came from underneath the pile a low contented cry of Ooja, 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 followed by a curious addition sounding like fuff 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 so i put them all together and named the strange newcomer to the icy domain of king gelidus fuff kuja sleep any more that night not a wink the same joy came over me that i used to feel on christmas morning long ago when chris kringle brought me some wonderful bit of mechanism moved by a secret spring for i always scorn to accept ordinary toys like ordinary children and oh how i longed for the morning when it would be time for me to bundle up the little man no longer him with a frozen smile but fuffkuja the live boy from far away with his curious little face screwed up into such a funny look and carry him to the palace how delighted schneeboule will be thought i and king gelidus too how he will unbend from his frigid majesty as he watches the antics of fuffkuja and how pleased all the dignified colty corpians including frosty fizz and glacier boy will be when i tell them that the little man with the frozen smile has come to life again what crowds of colty corpse men women and children will rush up the long flights of steps leading to the ice palace begging and treating king gelidus to let them have just a little look at fuffkuja the little man set free from his icy cell by the famous traveler baron sebastian von trump end of chapter 26
Chapter 27 of Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood. Chapter 27 Excitement over Fufkuja. I carry him to the court of King Gelidus, his instant affection for the Princess Schneebull, I am accused of exercising the black art, my defense and my reward, anxiety of the cultic works lest Fufkuja perish of hunger. This calamity averted, another stares us in the face, how to keep him from freezing to death. I solve the problem, but draw upon me a strange misfortune. It all turned out just as I had thought it would. The moment it became known that the little man with the frozen smile had actually come to life, the wildest excitement prevailed in every part of the icy domain of his frigid majesty. I was astounded at the change in the actions of the cultic corpse. They moved more quickly, they talked faster, they made more gestures than I had ever seen them do before. In some cases, you will hardly believe it, dear friends. I actually noticed a faint glow in the cold cheeks of a few of them. I had hoped to be able to bundle Fufkuja up warmly and make my escape to the ice palace before the people learned of his coming to life, but in vain. When I made my appearance at the door, there was a large crowd of cultic worms pushing and pulling in front of my quarters. Most of them were good-natured and cried out, Show him to us, little baron! Show us the little man with the frozen smile whom thou hast brought to life. Let us look upon his face. Nay, nay, cultic corpse, I exclaimed. It must not be. His frigid majesty must be the first to look upon Fukuja's face. Room, room for the noble guest of royal Galitus. In the name of his frigid majesty, give way and let me pass. The cultic corpse showed no inclination to obey. To such a pitch of excitement had they worked themselves up that only upon seeing Bolger advance upon them with flashing eye and teeth laid bare did they reach the conclusion that my brave companion was in no mood to be trifled with. Thwarted in their wild desire to get a peep at Fufkuja, the culty corps now began to rail at me as I passed them by on my way to the ice palace. Ho ho, master magician! Ha ha, prince of the black art! Boo, boo, little wizard! Have a care, wily necromancer. See to it that thou dost not practice any of thy tricks of enchantment upon us. I was glad when the axe-bearer saw my plight and hurried forward to extricate me from the crowd of angry people. King Galitus met me at the portal of his ice palace, and at his heels came Princess Schneebull, who could hardly wait for her turn to take a look at the curious living creature which I unwrapped just enough to let her see its nose. The instant Fufkuja set eyes upon the sweet face of the Kertuwapian princess, he stretched out his little arm as a child might to its mother. This sudden show of affection caused Schneebull the liveliest pleasure, and quickly drawing off one of her gloves, she reached out and stroked the animal's head. But at the touch of those, to him, icy little fingers, he uttered a low wail and drew back underneath the warm pelt in which he was snugly wrapped. Poor Schneebull! She gave a sigh as she saw him do this, but it didn't prevent her from coming every minute or so and lifting one end of the pelt just enough to take another look at Fufkuja, who, while he never failed to cuddle up closer to me at sight of the princess, yet invariably thrust out one of his black paws from under the pelt for Schneebel to shake. While seated on the divan nearest the throne, I observed that Frosty Fizz and Glacier Boy were holding a whispered conference with his frigid majesty. All at once, I guessed the subject of their conversation. Rising to my feet, I made a sign that I wished to address the king, and when he had nodded his head with stern and icy dignity, I began to speak. You know, dear friends, how eloquent I can be when the mood is upon me. Well, standing there almost upon the steps of King Glidus's throne of ice, I proceeded to defend myself against the charge of being a master of the black art. I will not tell you all I said, but this was my ending. May it please your frigid majesty. 
Here beside me stands the only magician in the case, and the only art, the only trick or charm which was exercised by him was that sweet power we called love. When first he set eyes upon his four-footed brother locked in the crystal cell of Schneebull's grotto, he pressed his nose again and again against its icy wall in vain attempt to know his kinsman, and turned away with a cry of sorrow to find that his keen scent could not penetrate to him. I cannot tell you how great was his joy when I laid Fufkuja stiff and stark upon my divan, for I knew not then the scheme ripening in Bolger's mind. But later all was plain enough. The loving dog leaves his master's breast and carries his true and tender heart over to where Fufkuja lies, raises the pelt, crawls in beside him, and presses his warm breast firm and hard against his brother's ice-locked heart and warms him into life again, then wakes me and tells me what he hath done. This, royal Galitus and most noble Fulte Works, is the only art that hath been used to bring Fufkuja back to life again, and to call it black is to slander the sunshine, rail at the lily, and call the sweet breath of heaven a vile and detestable thing. When I had ended my speech, I saw that Schneebull had been weeping and that several of her tears stopped in their course down her cheeks, hung there sparkling like tiny diamonds in the soft light of the alabaster lamps, where the chill air of Belinus's palace had turned them into ice. And therefore, when his frigid majesty said that my words had touched his heart, and bade me ask for a gift from his hand, I said, O cold king of this fair icy domain, let those tears that now hang like tiny jewels on Schneebull's cheeks be brushed into an alabaster box and given to me. I covet no other guerdon. Even if I did not love thee, little baron, cried King Galitus with an icy smile, I would be persuaded. But loving makes easy believing. Go, frosty fizz, and bid one of the princess's women brush those tiny jewels that hang on Schneebull's cheek into an alabaster cup and bestow them upon the little baron. Scarcely had this been done when Fufkuja thrust his head out from under the pelt and, fixing his eyes pleadingly upon me, thrust out his tongue and opened and shut his mouth with a faint smacking noise. Quick as a flash it dawned upon me that those signs meant that Fufkuja was hungry. And then, as I suddenly remembered that the culty corpse were strictly a meat-eating people, that only meat was to be had in their chill domain, quarried almost like marble itself from nature's great refrigerators, a gasp escaped my lips, and I whispered, Oh, he must die! He must die! My words had not missed the keen ears of Princess Schneebel. Speak, little baron, she cried. Why, why must little Fufkuja die? What dost mean by such a saying? And when King Galitus and Schneebel had heard me voice my fear that he would die rather than feed on meat, they both became very heavy-hearted. Poor little Fufkuja, moaned the princess. Can it be possible that he must be carried back so soon to his crystal cell in my grotto? Bid the master of my meat quarries approach the throne, cried King Galita suddenly in a voice of icy dignity. This important functionary soon made his appearance. Turning to me, the king bade me explain the case to him. This I did in a few words, when, to the great joy of all present, the master of the meat quarry spoke as follows. Little Baron, if that's the only trouble, give thyself no further uneasiness, for I shall at once send one of my men to thee with a supply of most delicious nuts. Delicious nuts? I repeated in a tone of amazement. Why, yes, little Baron, I have a goodly supply on hand. Know, then, that hardly a day goes by that my men don't come upon some fine specimen of the family of gnaws, most generally squirrels, in whose cheek pouches we invariably find from one to half a dozen dainty nuts stowed away. It has always been my custom to lay these aside, and so I have to inform thee that if Fufkuja should live to be a hundred years old, I or my successor could guarantee to keep him supplied with food. These words lifted a terrible load off my heart, for now, at least, Fufkuja would not die of starvation. For a few days everything went well. 
the Colty Corps became quite satisfied in their own minds that I had not been practicing the black art in the chilly kingdom of his frigid majesty, and each and every one of them became greatly attached to the curious little creature with a droll little face and droller manner. But it seemed as if we were no sooner out of one trouble than we were plumped into another, for now Fufkuja began to object to the attendant selected to look after him by King Kalidus. The man was about ten degrees too cold-blooded for him, and ere long it was only necessary for the Colticorp to approach Fuff, as we called him for short, in order to throw him into convulsions of shivering, and to cause him to utter pitiable cries of discontent, which only ceased upon my appearing and comforting him by my caresses. I now set to work to devise some way to make Fuff's life more agreeable to him, for everybody seemed to hold me responsible for his well-being. Ten times a day came messengers from King Galitus or from Princess Schneeble to ask how he was getting on, and whether we were keeping him warm enough, whether he had all he wanted to eat, whether he had pelts enough on his bed. Nor was it an unusual thing to have a score or more culty and mothers call at my quarters during a single day with advice enough to last a month. And therefore was it that, with a view to providing him with a warmer room to sleep in, I ordered a divan fitted up for him in a smaller chamber opening into mine, upon the walls of which I directed half a dozen of the largest lamps to be hung. The consequence was that the walls began to melt, hearing of which consternation spread throughout the icy domain of his frigid majesty, for to the mind of a colty quirpin heat powerful enough to melt ice was something terrible. It was like the dread of earthquake shock to us, or the fear of flood or flame, it was something that filled their hearts with such terror that in their dreams they saw the solid walls of the ice palace melt asunder and fall with a crash. They could not bear it, and so King Galitus put forth the decree that if there were no other way to keep Fufkuja alive, then must he die. Hearing this, a novel grief came upon poor Schneeble's heart, for she had learned to love little Fuff very dearly, and it set a knife in her breast to think of losing him. Never, never, she cried, shall I be able to set foot within my grotto if Fufkuja is put back into his crystal prison again, with his frozen smile on his face as once used to be. And seeking out her royal father, she threw herself at his knees and spoke as follows. O oh, heart of ice, O oh, frigid majesty, let not thy child die of grief. There is an easy way out of all our troubles with dear little Fufkuja. Speak, beloved Schneeble, answered King Galitus. Let me hear what it is. Why, cold heart, said the princess, the little baron has plenty of warmth stored away in his body. He hath enough for both himself and Fufkuja into the bargain. Therefore, frigid father, command that a deep warm hood be made to the little baron's coat, and that Fufkuja be placed therein, and be borne about by the little baron wherever he goeth. He will soon grow accustomed to the slender burden, and note it no more. It shall be as thou wishest, replied the king of the Colty Corps, and calling his trusty counsellor, Kleshevoy, he directed him to summon me at once to the throne room. When I heard this terrible order issue from the icy lips of King Galitus, my heart sank within me, and yet I dared not disobey, I dared not murmur for I it was who had cleft asunder the crystal prison of the little man with a frozen smile, I who had made it possible for Bolger to warm him back to life again. Oh, poor, vain, weak, foolish boy that I had been! What was to become of me now? End of chapter 27 Recording by Todd Chapter 28 of Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M.B. in Washington State. Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood. Chapter 28. How a little burden may grow to be a grievous one. Story of a man with a monkey in his hood. My terrible suffering. Concerning the awful panic that seized upon the Colty Quirps. My visit to the deserted ice palace. And what happened to Fufkuja. 
End of his brief but strange career. A frozen kiss on a blade of horn, or how Schneeble chose a husband. Ah, little princess, how easy was it for thee to say that I would soon grow accustomed to the slender burden and note it no more. How prone are we to call light the burdens which we lay upon the shoulders of others for our own benefit. True, Fafkuja was not as long as a horse, nor as broad as an ox, and when in accordance with the king's decree the hood had been completed and the little animal was stowed away therein, close against my back so as to get a goodly share of the warmth of my body. It seemed to me that Schneebule was right, that I would soon become accustomed to the load and note it no more. And so it seemed the second and third day, but not on the fourth, for on that day the little load appeared to have gained somewhat in weight, and although I was quick to feign that it was not so when Princess Schneebule quizzed me, saying, There, little baron, did I not tell thee that thou wouldst soon forget that Fafkuja slept on thy shoulders? Yet in my heart I felt that he really had grown a month heavier. On the fifth day, Bulger and I were bidden to a merry-making at the Palace of Ice, and as I rose from my divan to betake me thither, methought I was strangely heavy-hearted, and so did Bulger, for he made several efforts to draw a smile or a cheery tone from me, but in vain. Suddenly I realized that there was a weight pressing against my back. No, not a heavy weight, but a weight all the same. And then I whispered to myself, Why, if I am going to be a merry-making, I'll cast it off. And then I awakened from my deep abstraction and murmured, How strange that I should have forgotten the Fafkuja was in my hood. And so I went to the merry-making with Fafkuja nestled between my shoulders, and the Kulti corpse laughed at the little baron and his child as they called him, and drew near and raised the flap and peeped in at the curious creature within the hood. And when Fafkuja felt their icy breaths, he buried his nose in the fur and sighed and whimpered. Then for a moment, when the Princess Schneebule came and sat beside me and praised me for my readiness to carry out her wishes, and thanked me so sweetly for my goodness to her, I forgot all about the little load laid upon me, and I ate the frozen tidbits from the royal kitchen and laughed and joked with Lords Frosty Fizz and Glacier Boy, just as had been my wont before Gelidus had decreed that Fafkuja should make his bed on my shoulders. But when the fete was over, and I stepped from the broad portal of the ice palace, and looked up at the mighty lens set in the mountainside, through which the moonlight of the outer world was streaming in subdued but glorious splendor, I suddenly felt my legs bend under me, I staggered from right to left. I clutched at shadows. I was, it seemed to me, about to be crushed beneath a terrible burden. I quickened my pace. I broke into a run. I threw my arms into the air as if I would cast off the weight that was smothering me. And so I came to my lodging, puffing, panting, gasping. Why, what a fool I am, was my first word when I had got my breath. It's only a little Fafkuja on my back, stowed away in my fur hood. I must be beside myself to a thought that a great monster was seated there and that he was gradually pressing me down, crushing the life out of me by degrees, flattening me to the very ground and I not able to escape from his terrible embrace or to squirm out from under his awful limbs wrapped around my neck and body. All night long this monster was clinging to me, and urging me to a faster pace, up and down, across and around, I knew not where, on bootless errands, ending only to begin again, on searches after nothing, hidden nowhere, trying a thousand lids and finding every one locked, returning home only to go forth again, up and away and out on interminable highways, vanishing in a point far on ahead, with that grievous burden forever on my shoulders growing heavier and heavier, till it seemed that I must go down with it into the dust. But no, it knew full well that it must not ride me to death. So when I was ready to drop, it threw off part of its weight to give me courage to begin again. When the morning came, my pulse was galloping, and my cheeks were on fire. I could feel the blood pounding against my temples, and it was natural that my face should be crimsoned over with the flush of fever. Half in a daze, I walked forth toward the grand staircase leading up to the ice palace, when suddenly I was startled by a fearful scream. I halted and looked up when another and another burst upon my ears. 
The terrified Coltycorps were fleeing before me in every direction, shrieking as they fled. Fly, brothers, fly, the little baron is burning. The little baron is burning. Fly, brothers, fly. In a few moments, terror had seized upon every living creature in the icy domain of King Gelidus. They fled from me in mad haste, taking refuge in the distant caverns and corridors, filling the air with their wild outcries, no one being brave enough to halt and take a second look. My inflamed countenance filled them with such awful terror that they could only tear along and cry, Fly, brothers, fly! The little baron is burning! The little baron is burning! With Bulger at my heels, I turned and sprang up the staircase with the intention of seeking out King Gelidus and explaining the matter to him. But he too had fled, and with him every sentinel and serving man, every courtier and counselor. The palace was as still as death. I hastened through its silent corridors, calling out, Schneebule, Princess Schneebule! Surely thou art not afraid of me. Turn back, I will not harm thee. I'm not burning. Turn back, oh, turn back. With this I reached the throne room. Not a living creature was to be seen. The vast chamber was still as death. I staggered to a divan and pillowing my poor aching head on a cushion, I fell into a sound and refreshing sleep. When I awoke, I rubbed my eyes and looked about me. And at first I thought that I was still alone in the great round chamber with its walls of ice. But no, there on the divan sat Schneebule, and she smiled and said in mock displeasure, Thou art not a very watchful nurse, little baron, for in thy sleep thou didst squeeze Fufku just so tightly against a cushion, and he crawled out from thy hood and nestled in my arms. In thy arms, Schneebule? I exclaimed breathlessly, for I feared for the worst. And springing up, I drew aside the soft belt which she had wrapped around Fafkuja, and there he lay, dead. Poor little beast! He had been so happy to crawl into the arms of one he loved so dearly, and had cuddled up closer and closer to her in search of greater warmth, but only to come nearer and nearer to a heart that could not warm him. And so the insidious chill of death, which bringeth sweet and pleasant drowsiness with it, had stole over him, and he had died and Schneebule's tears, freezing as they fell, now showered like the gentle hail of tiny gems upon the little dead beast. No longer Fuff Kuje, but once again the little man with the frozen smile. Presently, the Colty corpse were recovered from their senseless fear, and first, one by one, then groupwise, they returned to their homes. King Gelidus and his court, coming back too, to the fair palace which they had abandoned in their wild fright when the cry had gone up the little baron was burning everybody was sorry to hear that fafkuja had died the second time and many were the frozen tears that dropped from the chilly cheeks of the colty corpse as they looked upon the little man with the frozen smile as he lay on the white pelt beside the princess schneebule that day we bore him back to the ice grotto and having laid him in the hollow molded by his body in the crystal block, it was closed again so skillfully by the king's quarrymen that no eye was keen enough to note where the cleavage had been, and the same uncanny glint was in his eyes. And when the Colty corpse saw this, their icy hearts felt a cold shiver of satisfaction, for not only was the little man with the frozen smile back in his crystal cell again, but all the fears and dreadful fancies which his coming to life again had given rise to were past and gone forever. In peace and quiet and sweet contentment reigned throughout the icy realm of his frigid majesty Gelidus, king of the Colty Quirps. Now nothing remained to make his cold heart crack with joy but to see his beloved child, Sneebule, make choice of a husband. And he had not long to wait, for one day upon entering the palace she saw a youth lying at the foot of the stairway overcome with sleep. In one hand he held an alabaster lamp, and in the other a new wick, which he was about to fit into it, for the youth was a lamp trimmer in the ice palace of King Gelidus. And when the princess Schneebule saw him lying there overcome with sleep, she stooped and kissed him on the cheek, and passed on without another thought about the matter, one way or the other. And the kiss froze on the cheek of the lamp trimmer, where Schneebule had pressed it. Presently, King Gelidus came tramping into the hallway with his breath white upon his beard, and he saw the youth lying there, and the frozen kiss on his cheek. 
and he bade Glacier Boy scrape the delicate frost crystals from the youth's face with a blade of polished horn. What hast there, father of mine? asked the princess, when she saw him bearing the blade of horn along so carefully. A kiss, which someone pressed upon the cheek of one of my lamp trimmers, now lying on the staircase, overcome with sleep, replied King Gelidus in ringing, icy tones. Why, father of mine, exclaimed Princess Schneeboule, now that thou speakest of it, I really believe the kiss is mine, for I recollect kissing someone as I entered the palace. I was deep in thought, but no doubt the youth pleased me as he lay there, asleep with lamp in one hand and wick in the other. And that lamp trimmer trimmed no more lamps in the ice palace of his frigid majesty Gelidus, king of the Coltiquerps. No doubt he made Schneeboule a very good husband, and I am quite sure that she made him a good wife. I would have been glad to tarry for the nuptial feast, but that was out of the question. I had stayed too long already. End of chapter 28Chapter 29 of Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood. Chapter 29 something concerning the many portals to the icy domain of king gelidus and the difficult task of choosing the right one how bulger solved it our farewell to the cold-blooded goldy corpse schneeboule's sorrow at losing us as bullibrain had once remarked when there are many doors it's a wise man who knows which is the right one to open and this I found to be the case when I attempted to take my departure from the icy domain of his frigid majesty Gelidus, king of the Coltiquerks. For there was a baker's dozen of galleries, in each of which, upon exploring it, I came, after a tramp of half a mile or so, up against a lofty gate of solid ice, curiously carved and fitting the end of the gallery as a cork does a bottle. No doubt you are wondering why I didn't make my way out of the Coltiquerpian kingdom by following the river, for the very good reason that it went no further than King Gelidus's domain, emptying into a vast reservoir, which apparently had a subterranean outlet, for its thick covering of ice always remained at the same height. The king's quarrymen were ordered to hew an opening through whichever door I should point out as the one that I wished to pass through. But I was informed by Frosty Fizz that according to the law of the land, but one door could be opened during any one year, so that if I found my way blocked and turned back again, it would mean a delay of twelve months. Bullibrain, with all his wisdom, was powerless to assist me, although I was half inclined to think that he might have done so had he been permitted to investigate the secret records of the kingdom, carved upon huge tablets of ice and stored away in the vaults of the palace. The fact of the matter is, King Gelidus was so desirous of having me assist at the marriage feast of Princess Schneeboule that he threw every obstacle in my way that he could, without openly showing his hand. Then Schneeboule herself, by the dancing of her clear gray eyes, gave me to understand that she too was hoping that I would make a mistake when I came to point out the door which I wanted open. Bulger saw that I was in trouble but he couldn't comprehend clearly what the trouble was. He kept his eyes fastened upon me, however, watching my every movement, hoping, no doubt, to solve the mystery. While sitting one day lost in thought over the very serious problem which I found myself called upon to solve, an idea struck me. I had noticed that in the meat quarries the workmen often made use of sounding rods, which were long pieces of polished bone ending in flint tips, a Coltiquerpian quarryman, by dexterously twisting his rod, was able to bore a hole six feet deep or more into the solid bed of ice when desirous of ascertaining the position of a carcass in the meat quarry, and it occurred to me that by piercing the portals of ice, which close their various corridors I have spoken of, possibly Bulger's keen scent might recognize that current of air which would have in it the odor of earth and rock. In other words, 
make choice for me of the portal which opened on that corridor leading away from the icy domain of King Gelidus, and not merely into some outlying chamber of his kingdom. His frigid majesty could not object to such experiments, for the law only forbade the hewing of openings large enough for the hewer to pass through. King Gelidus and half a dozen of his courtiers, looking stern and frigid and conversing in freezing tones, were present to see the experiment tried. Methought their icy lips clacked together with satisfaction when at my request one portal after another was pierced. But Bulger, after sniffing at the hole, turned away with a bewildered look in his eyes, as if he didn't half understand why I was ordering him to thrust his warm nose into such cold places. And so we tramped from corridor to corridor until the quarrymen began to show signs of fatigue and the sounding rod turned slower and slower in their hands. Frosty Fizz blinked his cold gray eyes as much as to say, Little Baron, thou must bide with us for another year. But I merely turned to the quarrymen and ordered them to pierce one more portal of ice ere we abandoned the task for the day. They went at the work of piercing the eleventh door with the pace of pack mules up a mountainside. But at last the sounding rod bored a way through, and at a wave of my hand the quarrymen fell back. In an instant, Bulger had his nose at the hole and took three or four quick, nervous sniffs, ending with a long, deep-drawn one, and then breaking out into a string of sharp, jerky, joyful barks, he began scratching furiously at the bottom of the portal. "'Your frigid majesty,' said I, with a low and stately bend of my body such as only those born to the manor can make, by this portal, at the coming of tomorrow's sun, I shall pass from your majesty's icy dominion. And when Frostyfizz and Glacier Boy heard these words of mine uttered so loftily, their eyes gleamed cold as steel. Then they followed the king in silence back to the palace of ice. Schneeboule met them in the grand hallway, and when she had looked upon their faces, she began to weep, for she loved me, and she loved Bulger too and her cold little heart could not bear the thought of our going. King Gelidus, however, soon recovered his spirits and ordered a feast with song and dance in honor of Bulger, who during the festivity sat on the highest divan with the softest pelt beneath him. And so many were the frozen tidbits which the culty courts presented to him during the progress of the feast that I grew alarmed lest he might overload his stomach and not be in a fit condition to make the early start on our journey, of which I had given notice to the culty corpian monarch. But his good sense saved him from doing so foolish a thing. In fact, I was greatly amused to see that, while he accepted every tidbit handed to him and solemnly went through the motions of chewing it, Yet watching his chance, he slyly dropped it out of his mouth and flirted it aside with his paw. Thus was spent our last night at the icy court of his frigid majesty. And on the morrow, the culty were collected in great crowds on the different terraces to say goodbye. I pressed a kiss on the cheek of Princess Schneeboule. When it had turned to ice crystals, one of her men brushed it into an alabaster box. Prince Chillychops, the former lamp trimmer, was on hand with the rest of the culty Corpian nobles, but I flattered myself that Schneeboule loved me better than she did him. However, I wished him joy, and gripped his cold palm with such warmth that he stood blowing it for a whole minute. When we reached the lofty portal, we found that the quarrymen had already hewn a passage through it, and nearby I observed a pile of massive blocks of ice, crystal clear. These, when Bulger and I should pass through the opening, were to be used in walling it up again. And when I saw this pile of blocks, and remembered the solid workmanship of the Colthy Corpian quarrymen, the thought flitted through my mind. Suppose Bulger hath not chosen wisely. What use would there be in turning back, for my own weak hands would be powerless against a wall built of such blocks? And knock I ever so loud. How could the sound ever traverse this long and winding corridor, and reach the ear of a Colty Corp? No, said I to myself, if Bulger hath not chosen wisely, it will be goodbye to both upper and underworlds. And then, bearing an alabaster lamp in one hand, and in the other holding the cord which I had tied to Bulger's collar, I stepped through the narrow passage hewn by the quarrymen, and turned my back forever on the cold dominion of Gelidus, king of the Colty Corps. Once I halted and looked back, I could see nothing. 
but I could hear the sharp click of the flint axes as the quarrymen closed up the door that shut me out from so many cold but loving hearts, and then I drew a long breath and went on my way again. And that was the last I ever saw of the Colty Corps, save in a daydream or night vision. End of chapter 29「Chapter Thirty of Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood. Chapter Thirty all about the most terrible but magnificent ride I ever took in my life. Ninety miles on the back of a flying mass of ice, and how Bulger and I were landed at last on the banks of a most wonderful river. How the day broke in this underworld. Had my hand at that moment not grasped a cord tied to the neck of my wise and keen-eyed Bulger, I really believe I would have come to a halt faced about, retraced my steps, and begged the inhabitants of this crystal realm to admit me once more into the cold kingdom where Gelidus held his icy court. For a sudden fit of depression came upon me as the chilly air struck against my cheeks, and I saw the deep darkness made visible by the tiny flame of my alabaster lamp. Cold though it might be, I would have sunshine in the icy land of the Colty Corpse, but now how could I tell what fate awaited me? Luckily, I had asked the captain of the meat quarries to allow me to retain one of his sounding rods with its flint point, for I feared, lest in descending some icy declivity, I might fall and bruise or even break a limb. I was determined to advance cautiously along this icy passage, shrouded as it was in impenetrable gloom, and so different from the broad and polished pavement of the marble highway. And hence, hanging the lamp about my neck, I proceeded to make use of the sounding rod as an alpenstock, for which purposes it was admirably adapted. Suddenly Bulger halted, gave a low whine of warning, and turned back. In an instant I knew that there was danger ahead, and letting myself drop on my hands and knees, crawled carefully along to make an investigation of the dangerous spot in our route, signaled by the watchful Bulger. It was only too true. We stood apparently upon the very edge of a sheer parapet. How high I had no way of ascertaining, but I was unable to reach any bottom with the sounding rod. What was to be done? Turn back? It was not yet too late. The Colty Corpian quarrymen could not have completed their task in so short a time. They would hear my knock. They would tear down their wall of ice and Gelidus and Schneeboule would welcome us back to their ice palace with a cold but honest satisfaction. As I sat there plunged in thought, I half-consciously began to twirl the sounding rod around until I had sunk it half in its length into the floor of ice, and then reaching out I encircled Bulger with my arm and drew him up against me as was my wont when preparing for profound meditation. I had scarcely done so when the ice beneath me gave one of those sharp, clear, cracking noises so unlike the sound made by the breaking of any other substance, and thereupon I felt the crystal mass on which Bulger and I were sitting tremble and vibrate for an instant, and then, with a sudden downward cant, break away from the mass behind it and begin to move. Instinctively, a sense of my awful peril prompted me to cling to the sounding rod, which I had sunk drill-like into the ice. Luckily, it was between my legs, and, quick as a flash, I entwined them around it, assuming a Turkish sitting posture, while my left arm was wrapped tightly around Bulger's body. I don't know how it was done, done as it was all in an instant, but there I sat, now firmly saddled, so to speak, upon that crystal monster's back, as with a creak and a crash, it snapped the crystal links which bound it to the wall of ice, and plunged headlong down the glassy slope. In my fright I had dropped my lamp, and now the deep gloom of this underworld enwrapped me. But no, 
it was not so for as the escaping block of ice creaked and crunched its way along the two cold crystal surfaces gave forth a weird glimmer of phosphorescent light which made the flying mass seem like a monstrous living thing out of whose thousand eyes were darting tongues of flame as it rushed madly along now gaining speed upon striking a steeper stretch of way now fouling with some obstruction and dashing against the rocky sides of the corridor and sending a shower of crystals sparkling and glittering in the black air anon the escaping block comes upon a gentle slope and with the low music of crushing crystals slips softly along in its flight as if mounted upon runners of polished steel and then with a sudden dip it glides upon a sharper descent and fairly leaps into the air as it bounds along hissing over the slippery roadway and leaving a train of fire behind it and now it strikes a stretch of way piled here and there with clumps and blocks of ice with a mad fury it springs upon the lesser ones with a growl of rage grinding them into powder which like showers of icy foam it hurls upon bulger and me seated on its back but some of the blocks resist its terrible onslaught and our mighty steed is hurled from side to side with crash and creak as it drives its crystal corners fiercely against the jutting rocks leaving marks of its white flesh on these black heads of adamant it seems an hour since the crystal monster broke away and yet ever downward he threads his wild flight butting bumping jostling veering staggering along bearing bulger and me to the lowest level of a world within a world will he ever end his mad flight is there no way for me to curb him must he fly until he has ground his very body to such a thinness that the next obstruction will shatter it into ten thousand pieces and hurl bulger and me to death as these thoughts are flitting through my mind the flying mass takes one last mad plunge which lands it on an almost level stretch of roadway by the different sound given out by the sliding block i know that we have left the regions of ice behind us and that our crystal sledge is gliding gently along over a track of polished marble but mile after mile it still glides along gently softly silently and then i dared to think that our lives are saved but so terrible had been the strain so fearful the anxiety so exhausting the effort necessary to hold my place on the block of ice and keep my beloved bulger from slipping out of my arms that i fell backward into a dead faint as the gliding mass came at last to a standstill i think i must have lain there a good half hour or so for when i came to myself bulger's frantic joy told me that he had been terribly wrought up over me and the moment i opened my eyes he began to shower caresses on my hands and face in most lover-like style dear grateful heart he felt that he owed his life this time to his little master and he wanted me to understand how thankful he was the moment bulger's nerves had recovered from the shock occasioned by my prolonged faint i reached for my repeater and touched its spring it registered one hour and a half since we had stepped through the icy portal of king Deladus's domain allowing a half hour for the time i lay unconscious it showed that our mad descent on the back of the crystal monster had lasted quite a full hour and reckoning the average speed of the escaping mass of ice to have been a mile and a half a minute that we were now in the neighborhood of ninety miles away from the cold kingdom where Gelidus sat on his icy throne the princess schneeboule at his feet with chili chops beside her it was with great difficulty that i could rise to my feet so stiffened were my joints and knotted my muscles after that terrible ride every instant of which i expected to be dashed to pieces against projecting rocks or torn to shreds by being caught between the fleeing monster of ice and the gigantic icicles hanging from the ceiling like the shining teeth of some huge creature of this underworld but could it be dear friends that bulger and i had only escaped a quick and merciful ending to be brought face to face with a death ten times more terrible in that it was to be slow and gradual denied even the poor boon of looking upon each other for darkness impenetrable was folded about us and silence so deep 
that my ears ached in their longing for some sound to break it. And yet there was something in the sound of my own voice that startled me when I used it. It seemed as if the awful stillness were angered at being disturbed by it, and smote it back into my teeth. Where are we? This was the question I put to myself, and then in my mind I strove to recall every word which I had read in the musty pages of Don Foon's manuscript concerning the world and the world. But I could recollect nothing to enlighten me, not a word to give me hope or cheer, and I was about to cry out in utter despair, when, happening to raise my eyes and look off in the distance, I saw what seemed to be a jack-o'-lantern dancing along the ground. It was a strange and fantastic sight in this region of inky darkness, and for a moment I stood watching it with bated breath and wide-open eyes. But no, it could not be a will-o'-the-wisp, for now the faint and uncertain glimmer had increased to a mild but steady glow reaching away off into the distance like a long line of dying campfires seen through an enveloping mist. But in a moment's time this wide encircling ring of light had so increased in brightness that it looked for all the world like a break of day in the land of sunshine. And here and there, where its mild effulgence overcame the darkness of this subterranean region, I caught sight of walls and arches and columns of snow-white marble, and then, as I called to mind Don Fum's mysterious reference to sunrise in the lower world, I swung my hat and gave a loud cry of joy, while Bulger waked the echoes of these spacious caverns by his barking. I tell you, dear friends, not until you have been in just such a plight can you know just how such a rescue feels. And now, no doubt, you are a bit anxious to know what sort of a sunrise could possibly take place in this underworld miles below our own. Well, when you have traveled as many miles as I have, and seen as many wonders as I have, you'll be ready to admit that wonders are quite as commonplace as commonplace itself. Know then that this vast region of the world within a world was girt round about by a broad and placid stream whose water swarmed with vast numbers of gigantic radiant animals, such as polyps, sea urchins, Portuguese men-of-war, sea anemones, and the like. That these transparent creatures, which had the power of emitting light, after lying dormant for twelve hours, gradually unfolded their bodies and tentacles, and rose toward the surface of these calm and limpid waters, increasing by degrees their mysterious radiance, until they had chased the darkness from the vast caverns opening upon the banks of the river, and lighted up this underworld with a soft effulgence, somewhat brighter than the rays of our full moon. For twelve hours these weird lanterns of the stream made it day for this nether world, and then as they gradually shrank together and sank out of sight, their expiring fires glowed with all the multicolored radiance of our fairest twilight. And that night, blacker than Stygian darkness, came back again. But now twas full daylight, and bidding Bulger follow me, I walked in silent wonder along the banks of this glowing stream, which, like a band of mysterious fire, as far as my eye could reach, went circling around the white marble mouths of these vast underground chambers. End of chapter 30 Chapter 31 of Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M.B. in Washington State. Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood. Chapter 31 in which you read of the glorious caverns of white marble fronting on the wonderful river in the tropics of the underworld how we came upon a solitary wanderer on the banks of the river my conversation with him and my joy at finding myself in the land of the rattle brains or happy forgetters brief description of them with every turn in the winding way that skirted the white shores of this wonderful stream its swarms of light-emitting animals lent it a new beauty, for as the day advanced, if I may so express it, they lifted their glowing bodies nearer and nearer to the surface, 
until now the river shone like molten silver, and as the sheer walls of rock on the opposite bank held set in them vast slabs of mica, the effect was that these gigantic natural mirrors reflected the glowing stream with startling fidelity, and threw the flood of soft light in dazzling shimmer against the fantastic portals of the white marble caverns on this side of the stream. It was a scene never to forget, and again and again I paused in silent wonder to feast my eyes upon some newly discovered beauty. Now, for the first time, I noted that every white marble basin of cove and inlet was filled with a different glow, according to the nature of the tiny phosphorescent animals which happened to fill its waters, one being a delicate pink, another a glorious red, the third a deep, rich purple, the fourth a soft blue, the fifth a golden yellow, and so on, the charm of each tint being greatly enhanced by the snowy whiteness of these marble basins, through which long lines of curious fish scaled in hues of polished gold and silver swam slowly along, turning up their glorious sides to catch the full splendor of the light reflected from the mica mirrors. And now the chilly breath of King Gelidus's domain no longer filled the air. I stood in the tropics of the underworld, so to speak, and but one thing was lacking to make my enjoyment of this fairy region complete, and that was someone to share it with me. True, Bulger had an idea of its beauty, for he testified his happiness at being once more in a warm land by executing some mad capers for my amusement, and by scampering along the shore of the glowing river and barking at the stately fish as they slowly fanned the water with their many-colored fins. But I must admit that I longed for the Princess Schneeboule to keep me company. But it was a rash wish, for the warm air would have thrown her into convulsions of fear, and she would have preferred to meet her death in the cool river, rather than attempt to breathe such a fiery atmosphere. By this time I had advanced several miles along the white shores of the glowing stream, and feeling somewhat fatigued, I was about to sit down on the jutting edge of a natural bench of rock, which seemed almost placed on the river banks by human hands for human forms to rest upon and watch the wonderful play of tints and hues in this wide sweeping inlet when to my amazement i saw that a human creature was already sitting there his eyes were fixed upon the water and methought that his face which was gentle and placid wore a tired look certainly he was plunged into such deep meditation that he either took or feigned to take no notice of my approach Bulger was inclined to dash forward and attract his attention by a string of ear-splitting barks, but I shook my head. This wanderer along the glowing stream of day wore rather a graceful cloak-like garment, woven of some substance that shimmered in the light, and so I concluded that it must be a mineral wool. His head was bare, and so were his legs to the knees, his feet being shod with white metal sandals tied on with what looked like leathern thongs. All in all, he had a friendly, though somewhat peculiar, look about him, and his attitude struck me as being that of a person either plunged into deep thought, or possibly listening for some anxiously expected signal. At any rate, accustomed as I was to meet all sorts of people on my travels in the four corners of the globe, I determined to make bold enough to interrupt the gentleman's meditations, and wish him good morrow. Whom have I the pleasure of meeting in this beautiful section of the world within a world? The man looked at me in a dazed sort of way and replied, I really don't know, I'm happy to say. But sir, thy name, I insisted. Forgot it years ago, was his remarkable answer. But surely, sir, I exclaimed rather testily, thou art not the sole inhabitant of this beautiful underworld. Thou hast kinsman, wife, family. Ay, gentle stranger, he replied in slow and measured tones. There are people farther along the shore, and they are good, dear souls. Although I have forgotten their names, and I have to a very faint recollection that two of these people are sons of mine. Stop, no, uh, their names are gone from me too. I forgot them the day my own name slipped from my mind. And as he uttered these words, he threw his head back with a sudden jerk, and I heard a strange click inside of it. 
as if something had slipped from its place in that instant the mysterious expression used by that master of masters don foon flashed through my mind rattle brains yes that was it and now i felt sure that i was standing in the presence of one of the curious folk inhabiting the world within a world to whom don foon had given the strange name of rattle brains or happy forgetters i was so delighted that i could barely keep myself from rushing up to this gentle visaged and mild-mannered person whose head had just given forth the sharp click and grasping him by the hand but i feared to shock him by such a friendly greeting and so i contented myself with crying out sir thou seest before thee none other than the famous traveller baron sebastian von trump but to my great amazement and greater chagrin he simply turned his strange eyes with the faraway look upon me for an instant and then resumed his contemplation of the beautifully tinted sheet of water as if i hadn't opened my mouth it was the most extraordinary treatment that i had experienced since my descent into the underworld and i was upon the point of resenting it as became a true knight and especially a von Trump, when don foon's brief description of the rattlebrains or happy forgetters flitted through my mind said he by the exercise of their strong wills they have been busy for ages striving to unload their brains of the to them now useless stock of knowledge accumulated by their ancestors and the natural consequence has been that the brains of these curious folk who call themselves the happy forgetters relieved of all labor and strain of thought have absolutely shrunken rather than increased in size so that with many of the happy forgetters their brains are like the shriveled kernel of a last year's nut and give forth a sharp click when they move their heads suddenly with a jerk as is often their wont for they take great pride in proving to the listener that they deserve the name of rattle brain nor do i need remind the old reader concluded don foon in his celebrated work on the world within a world that the chiefest among the happy forgetters is the man whose head gives forth the loudest and sharpest click for he it is who has forgotten most you can have but a faint idea dear friends of my delight at the prospect of spending some time among these curious people people who look with absolute dread upon knowledge as the one thing necessary to get rid of before happiness can enter the human heart. No joy can equal the happy forgetters when upon clasping a friend's hand he finds that he has forgotten his very name, and no day is well spent in this land at the close of which the inhabitant may not exclaim, This day I succeeded in forgetting something that I knew yesterday. At last the happy forgetter rose from his seat and calmly walked away without so much as wishing me good day. But I was resolved not to be so easily gotten rid of, so I called after him in a loud voice, and Boulder, following my example, raised a racket at his heels, whereupon he faced about and remarked, Beg pardon, I had quite forgotten thee, I am happy to say, and thy name too. I've forgotten that. Let me see, art thou a radiant? one of the animals in the water i was more than half inclined to lose my temper at this slur classing me a backboned animal with a mere jellyfish but under all the circumstances i thought it best to control myself for i could well imagine that from the size of my head and the utter absence of all click inside of it i was not destined to be a very welcome visitor among the happy forgetters and therefore swallowing my injured feelings i made a very low bow and begged this curious gentleman to be kind enough to conduct me to his people among whom i wished to abide for a few days end of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of baron trump's marvelous underground journey this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood. Chapter 32. How We Entered the Land of the Happy Forgivers. Something more about these curious folk their dread of vulgar and me only a stay of one day accorded us 
description of the pleasant homes of the happy forgetters, a revolving door through which Bulger and I are unceremoniously set outside of the domain of the rattle brains, all about the extraordinary things which happened to Bulger and me thereafter, once more in the open air of the upper world, and then homeward bound. The happy forgetter pursued his way calmly along the winding path that skirted the glowing river, apparently, and no doubt really, unconscious of the fact that Bulger and I were following close at his heels. After half an hour or so of this silent tramp, he suddenly came to a standstill, and with his placid countenance turned toward the light, seemed to be so far away in thought that for several moments I hesitated to address him. But as there were no signs of his showing any disposition to come to himself, I made bold to ask him the cause of the delay. I'm happy to say, he remarked, without so much as deigning to turn his head, that I've forgotten which of these two roads leads to the homes of our people. Well, this was a pleasant outlook to be sure, and I don't know what we should have done had not Bulger solved the difficulty for us by making choice of one of the paths and dashing on ahead with a bark of encouragement for us to follow. When I assured the happy forgetter that he need have no fear as to the wisdom of the choice, he gave a start of almost horror at the information. For you must know, dear friends, that the happy forgetter has more head of knowledge than we have of ignorance. To learn it is the mother of all discontent, the source of all unhappiness, the cause of all the dreadful ills that have come upon the world and the people in it. The world, said one of the happy forgetters to me sadly, was perfectly happy once, and man had no name for his brother, and yet he loved him even as the turtle dove loves his mate, although he has no names to call her by. But alas, one day this happiness came to an end, for a strange malady broke out among the people. They were seized with a wild desire to invent names for things, even many names for the same thing, and different ways of doing the same thing. This strange passion grew so upon them that they spent their lives in making them in every possible way harder to live. They built different roads to the same place. They made different clothes for different days and different dishes for different feasts. To each child they gave two, three, and even four different names. And different shoes were fashioned for different feet. And one family was no longer satisfied with one drinking gourd. Did they stop there? Nay, they now busied themselves learning how to make different faces to different friends, covering a frown with a smile, and singing gay songs when their hearts were sad. In a few centuries a brother could no longer read a brother's face, and one half of the world went about wondering what the other half was thinking about. Hence arose misunderstandings, quarrels, feuds, warfare, man was no longer content to dwell with his fellow man in the spacious caverns which kind nature had hollowed out for him, piercing the mountains with winding passages beside which his narrow streets dwindled to merest pathways. In the land of the happy forgetters, care never comes to trouble sleep, nor anxious thought to wear the dread mask of tomorrow. Happy the day on which this child of nature might exclaim, since morn I've forgotten something, I've unloaded my mind. It's one thought lighter than it was. He was the happiest of the happy forgetters who could honestly say, I know not thy name, nor when thou wast born, nor where thou dwellest, nor who thy kinsmen are. I only know that thou art my brother, and that thou wilt not see me suffer if I should forget to eat, or perish of thirst if I forget to drink, and that thou wilt bid me close my eyes if I should forget that I had laid me down to sleep. Bulgers and my arrival in the land of the happy forgetters filled the hearts of these curious folk with secret dread. At sight of my large head they all began to tremble, like children in the dark stricken with fear of boogie or goblin, and with one voice they refused to permit me to sojourn a single brief half-hour among them. But gradually this sudden terror passed off a bit and after a council held by a few of the younger men, whose brains as yet completely filled their heads, it was determined that I might bide for another day in their land. 
but that then the revolving door should be opened and Bulger and I be thrust outside of their domain. From what Don Foom had written about the Happy Forgetters, I knew only too well that it would be useless for me to attempt to reverse this decree, so I held my peace, except to thank them for this great favor shown me. The daylight, if I may call it so, now began to wane, or rather, the thousands of light-giving creatures swarming in the river now began to draw in their long tentacles, close their flower-like bodies, and slowly sink to the bottom of the stream. I was quite anxious to see whether the happy forgetters would make any attempt to light up their cavernous homes, or whether they would simply creep off to bed and sleep out the long hours of pitchy darkness. To my surprise, I overheard the clicking of flints on all sides, and in a moment or so a thousand or more great candles made of mineral wax with asbestos wicks were lighted, and the great chambers of white marble were soon aglow with these soft and steady flame. The happy forgetters were strictly vegetable eaters, feeding upon the various fungus plants growing in these caverns in great profusion, together with a very nutritious and pleasant-tasting jelly made from a hardened gum of vegetable origin which abounded in the crevices of certain rocks. There was still another source of food, namely the nests of certain shellfish, which they built against the face of the rock just above the surface of the water. These dissolved in boiling water made an excellent broth, very much like the soup from edible birds' nests. The clothes worn by the happy forgetters were entirely woven from mineral wool, which in these caverns gave a long and strong fiber of astonishing softness. The rattle grains were tolerably good metal workers too, but contented themselves with fashioning only such articles as were actually necessary for daily use. Their beds were stuffed with dried seaweed and lichens, and Bulger and I passed a very comfortable night. As I was forbidden to speak aloud, to ask a question, or to walk abroad, unless in company with one of the selectmen, I was not sorry when the moment came for the revolving door to be opened. The happy forgetters had been led to believe that Bulger and I were a thousand times more dangerous than scaly monsters or black-winged vampires, and hence they held themselves aloof from us, the children hiding behind their mothers, and the mothers peering through crack and crevice at us. The size of my head inspired them with a nameless dread, and even the half-dozen of the younger and more courageous drew aside instinctively to let me pass. For the first time in my life I was an object of horror to my fellow creatures, but I had no hard thoughts against them. Timid children of nature that they were, to them I was as terrible an object as the torch-armed demon of destruction would be to us were he let loose in one of our fair cities of the upper world. And now the guard of happy forgetters had halted in front of what seemed to be a huge cask fashioned of solid marble, and set one half within the white wall of the cavern to which they had led me. But on second glance I saw that there was a row of square holes around its bulge like those in the top of a capstan. The happy forgetters now disappeared for a moment, and when they joined me again each bore in hand a metal bar, the end of which lies set in one of these holes, and then at a signal from the leader the huge half-circle of marble began to turn noiselessly around, exactly like a capstan. As each man's lever came to the wall, he shifted it to the front again. Suddenly, to my amazement, I saw that the great marble cask was hollow, like a sentry box. And you may judge of my feelings, dear friends, upon being politely requested to step inside. Did I refuse to obey? Not I. It would have been useless. For was not the whole tribe of rattlebrains there to lay hands upon me and thrust me in? So taking off my hat and making a low bow to the little group of happy forgetters, I stepped within the hollow cask, and Bulger did the same. But not with so good a grace as his master, for casting an angry glance at the inhospitable dwellers in these chambers of white marble, he growled and laid bare his teeth to show his contempt for them. Now the great marble cask began to revolve the other way, and in a moment it was back in place again. 
I heard several sharp clicks as if a number of huge spring latches had snapped into place, and then all was silent as the tomb, and I had almost said as dark too. But no, I could not say that, for I looked out into a low tunnel which ran past the niche in which Bulger and I were standing, and to my more than wonder it was dimly lighted. I stepped out into it. It was as round as a cannon bore, and just high enough for me to stand erect. And now I discovered whence the light proceeded. In the cracks and crevices of its walls grew vast masses of those delicate light-giving fungus rootlets, the glow of which was so strong that I had no difficulty in reading and writing on my tablets. In fact, I stood there for several minutes making entries by the light of these bunches of glowing rootlets. Then the thought flashed through my mind, which way shall I turn? To the right or to the left? Bulger comprehended the cause of my vacillation and made haste to come to my rescue. After sniffing the air, first in one direction and then in the other, he chose the right hand, and I followed without a thought of questioning his wisdom. Strange to say, he had not advanced more than a few hundred rods before I noticed that there was a strong current of air blowing through the tunnel in the direction Bulger had taken. Every moment it increased in violence, fairly lifting us from our feet and bearing us along through this narrow bore made by nature's own hands and lighted too by lamps of her own fashioning. The motion of the air through this vast pipe caused bursts of mighty tones as if peeled forth by some gigantic organ played by giant hands. It was strange, but yet I felt no terror as I listened to this unearthly music, although its depth of tone jarred painfully upon my eardrums. By the dim light of the luminous rootlets, I could see Bulger just ahead of me, and I was content. No shiver of fear ran down my back, or robbed my limbs of their full power to resist the ever-increasing pressure of the air. But as it grew stronger and stronger, half of my own accord and half because Bulger set the example, I broke into a run. Our pace once quickened, it was impossible for me to slow up again. On, on, in a mad race, my feet scarcely touching the bottom of the tunnel I sped along while the great pipe for which I was born on the very wings of the gale sent forth its deep and majestic peal. There was something strangely and mysteriously exciting in this race, and all that kept me from enjoying it to my full bent was the thought that a sudden increase in the violence of the blast might toss me violently on my face and possibly break an arm for me or injure me in some serious way. All at once the deep peeling forth of the organ-like tone ceased, and in its stead came the awful sound of rushing water. Before I had time to think it was upon me, striking me like a terrific blow from some gigantic fist wearing a boxing glove. The next instant I was caught up like a cork on a mountain torrent, swayed from side to side, twisted, turned, sucked down and cast up again, whirled over and over, tossed and tumbled, rolled along like a wheel, my arms and legs the spokes. Wonderful to relate, I did not lose consciousness, as this terrible current shot me like a stick of timber through the flume, whether I knew not, only that the speed and volume went ever on, increasing until at last the tumultuous torrent filled the tunnel and robbed me of light, of breath, of life, of everything, including my faithful and loving Bulger. How long it lasted, this fearful ride in the arms of these mad waters, rushing as if for life or death through this narrow bore, I know not. I only know that my ears were suddenly assailed with a mighty whiz and rush of water as through the nozzle of some gigantic hose, and that I was shot out into the glorious sunshine out onto the grand, free, open air of the upper world, and sent flying up toward the dear blue sky with its flecks of fleecy cloudlets, and Bulger some twenty feet ahead of me, and that then with a gracefully curved flight through the soft and balmy air of harvest time, we both were gently dropped into a quiet little lake, nestled at the foot of a hillside yellow with ripened corn. In a moment or so, we had swum ashore. Bulger wanted to halt and shake the water from his thick coat, 
but I couldn't wait for that. Wet as he was, I clasped him to my heart while he showered caresses on me. But not a word was said, not a sound was uttered. We both of us too happy to speak. And if you have ever been in that state, dear friends, you know how it feels. I can't describe it to you. At this moment, some men and boys clad in the garb of the Russian peasant came racing across the fields to see what I was about, no doubt, for I had stripped off my heavy outside clothing and was spreading it out in the sun to dry. Upon sight of these red-cheeked children of the upper world, I was so overcome with joy that for a moment or so I couldn't get a syllable across my lips, but making a great effort, I cried out, Fathers, brothers, where am I? Speak, my dear souls. In northeastern Siberia, little soul, replied the eldest of the party, not far from the banks of the Obi. But whence comest thou? By St. Nicholas, I believe thou wast spit out of the spouting well. What art thou doing here alone? I paid no attention to the question. I was thinking of something else of more importance to me, to wit, my splendid achievement the marvelous underground journey i had just completed fully five hundred miles in length passing completely under the ural mountains after a short stay at the nearest village i engaged the best guide that was to be had and crossed the urals by the pass in the most direct line re-entered russia and made haste to join the first government train on its way to st petersburg Having dispatched a courier with letters to my beloved parents, informing them of my good health and whereabouts, I passed several weeks very pleasantly in the Russian capital, and then, by easy stages, set out for home. The elder baron came as far as Riga to meet me, and brought me the best of news from Castle Trump, that my dear mother was in perfect health and that she and every man, woman, and child in and about the castle were anxiously awaiting to give me a real German welcome back home. And here, dear friends, mit Herzlin, Greece, Bulger and I take our leave of you. End of chapter 32 End of Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood
but her brother hadn't placed those clothes there to catch me. They weren't thrown higgledy-piggledy into a heap either, but were laid one upon the other, the heaviest at the bottom. Having unwound myself and lighted one of my wax tapers, I made haste to cast away the undergarment with its coating of black lead and resume my clothing. Then, stooping down, I made an examination of the floor. It was composed of huge blocks of marble of various colors, polished almost as smooth as if the hand of man had wrought the work, and then I knew that I was on nature's marble highway leading to the cities of the underworld which Don Fum had mentioned in his book. And I remembered, too, that he had spoken of nature's mighty mosaics, huge, fantastic figures on the walls of these lofty corridors, made up of various colored blocks and fragments, laid one upon the other as if with design, and not by the wild, tempestuous whims of upbursting forces thousands of years ago, when the earth was in its mad and wayward youth. After a rest of several hours, during which I nursed my torn hands and bruised fingers, Bulger and I were up and off again along this broad and glorious marble highway. Strange to say, it was not the inky darkness of the ordinary cavern which filled these magnificent chambers, through which the marble highway went winding in stately and massive grandeur. Far from it. The gloom was tempered by a faint glow that met us on the way ever and anon, like a ray of twilight gone astray. Anyway, Bulger, I noticed, could see perfectly well. So, tying a bit of twine to his collar, I sent him on ahead, convinced that I could have no surer guide. At times, our path would be lighted up for an instant by the bursting out of a little tongue of flame either on the sides or from the roof of the gallery. I was puzzled for quite a while to tell what it proceeded from, but at last I caught sight of the source, or rather the maker of this welcome illumination. It proceeded from a lizard-like animal, which, by suddenly uncoiling its tail, had the power to emit this extremely bright flash of phosphorescent light, and in so doing he made a sharp crack for all the world like the noise of an electric spark. Bulger was delighted with this performance, and on one occasion, not being able to control his feelings, he uttered a sharp bark, whereupon apparently ten thousand of these little torchbearers snapped their tails at me at the same instant, and filled the vast place with a flash of light of almost lightning-like intensity. Bulger was so frightened by the result of his applause that he took good care to keep quiet after this. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M.B. in Washington State. Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood. Chapter 7. Our first night in the underworld, and how it was followed by the first break of day. Bulger's warning, and what it meant. We fall in with an inhabitant of the world within a world. His name and calling. Mysterious return of night. The land of beds, and how our new friend provided one for us. So heavy with sleep did my eyelids become at last, that I knew that it must be night in the outer world. And so we halted, and I stretched myself at full length on that marble floor, which, by the way, was pleasantly warm beneath us. And the air, too, was strangely comforting to the lungs, there being a complete absence of that smell of earth and odor of dampness so common in vast subterranean chambers. My sleep was long continued and most refreshing. Bulger was already awake, however, when I sat up and tried to look about me. He began tugging at the string which I had fastened to his collar, as if he wanted to lead me somewhere. So I humored him and followed along after. To my delight, he led me straight to a pool of deliciously sweet and cold water. Here we drank our fill, and after a very frugal breakfast on some dried figs, set out again on our journey along the marble highway. Suddenly, to my more than joy, 
the faint and uncertain light of the place began to strengthen. Why, it seemed almost as if the day of the upper world were about to break. So delicate were the various hues in which the ever-increasing light clothed itself. Then, as if affrighted at its own increasing glory, it would fade away again, almost to gloom. Ere many moments again, this faint and mysterious glow would return, beginning with the softest yellow, then changing to a dozen different tints, and like a fickle maid uncertain which to wear, put all aside and don the lily's garb. Bulger and I wandered along the marble highway, almost afraid to break the stillness so deep that it seemed to me as if I could hear those sportive rays of light in their play against the many-colored rocks arching this mighty corridor. Now, as the marble highway swept around in a graceful curve, a dazzling flood of light burst upon us. It was sunrise in the world within a world. Whence came this flood of dazzling light which now caused the sides and arching roof to glow and sparkle as if we had suddenly entered one of nature's vast storehouses of polished gems? Shading my eyes with my hand, I looked about me in order to try and solve the mystery. It did not take me long to understand it all. Know then, dear friends, that the ceilings, domes, and arched roofs of this underground world were fretted with a metal of greater hardness than any known to us children of sunshine. Its seams ran hither and thither like the veins of gigantic leaves, and at certain hours currents of electricity from some vast internal reservoir of nature's own building streamed through these metal traceries until they glowed with a heat so white as to give off the flood of dazzling light of which i have already spoken the current never came with a sudden rush or burst but began gently and timidly so to speak as if feeling its way along hence the beautiful tints that always preceded sunrise in this lower world and made it so much like the coming and going of our glorious sunshine. The marble highway now divided, and the two halves of the fork curving away to the right and left enclosed a small but exquisitely ornamented park, or pleasure ground, I may call it, provided with seats of some dark wood beautifully polished and carved. This park was ornamented with four fountains, each springing from a crystal basin and spreading out into a feathery spray that glistened like whirling snow in the dazzling white light. As Bulger and I directed our steps toward one of the benches with the intention of taking a good rest, a low growl from him warned me to be on the alert. I gave a second look. A human being was seated on the bench. Beside myself as I was, with curiosity to come face to face with this inhabitant of the underworld, the first we had met, I made a halt, determined to ascertain, if possible, whether he was quite harmless before accosting him. He was small in stature, and clad entirely in black, a sort of loose flowing robe much like a Roman toga. His head was bare, and what I could see of it was round, smooth, and rosy, with about as much hair, or rather fuzz, upon it as the head of an infant six weeks old. His face was hidden by a black fan which he carried in his right hand, and the uses of which you will learn later on. His eyes were shielded from the intense glare of the light by a pair of colored glass goggles. As he raised his hand between me and the light, I couldn't help catching my breath. I could see right through it. The bones were as clear as amber. His head, too, was only a little less opaque. Suddenly, two words from Don Fum's manuscript flashed through my mind, and I exclaimed joyously, Bulger, we're in the land of the transparent folk. At the sound of my voice, the little man arose and made a low bow, lowering his fan to his breast where he held it. His baby face was ludicrously sad and solemn. Yes, sir stranger, said he, in a low musical voice, thou art indeed in the land of the Mycomenthes, Mycomenthes, in the land of the transparent folk, called also Coggleland. But if I should show thee my heart, thou wouldst see that I am deeply pained to think that I should have been the first to bid thee welcome, for no, sir stranger. But thou speakest with Master Old Soul, the court depressor, the saddest man in all Goblin Land, 
and by the way, sir, permit me to offer thee a pair of goggles for thyself, and also a pair for thy four-footed companion, for our intense white light would blind thee both in a few days. I thanked Master Cold Soul very warmly for the goggles, and proceeded to set one pair astride my nose, and to tie the other in front of Bulger's eyes. I then, in most courteous manner, informed Master Cold Soul who I was, and begged him to explain the cause of his great sadness. Well, thou must know, little baron, said he, after I had taken a seat beside him on the bench, that we, the loving subjects of Queen Galaxa, whose royal heart is almost run down, excuse these tears, living as we do in this beautiful world, so unlike the one you inhabit, which our wise men tell us is built, strange to say, on the very outside of the earth's crust, where it is most exposed to both full sweep of blinding snow, freezing blast, pelting hail, drowning rain, and choking dust living as we do i say in this vast temple by nature's own hands builded where disease is unknown and where our hearts run down like clocks that may have but one winding we are prone alas to be too happy to laugh too much to spend too much time in idle gaiety chattering the time away like thoughtless children amused with baubles, delighted with tinsel nothings. Know then, little bear, that mine is the business to check this gaiety, to put an end to this childish glee, to depress our people's spirits, lest they run too high. Hence my garb of inky hue, my rueful countenance, my frequent outline of tears, my voice ever attuned to sadness. Excuse me, little baron. My fan slipped then. Didst see through me? I would not have thee see my heart today. For some way or other I cannot bring it to a slow pace. It is dreadfully unruly. I assured him that I had not seen through him as yet. And now, dear friends, I must explain that by the laws of the Michaelmenkes, each man, woman, and child must wear in their garments a heart-shaped opening on their breast directly over their hearts with a corresponding one at the back, so that under certain conditions when the law allows it, each may have the right to take a look at his neighbor's heart and see exactly how it is beating, whether fast or slow, whether throbbing or leaping, or whether pulsating naturally. But this privilege is only accorded, as I have said, under certain conditions. Hence, to shut off inquisitive glances, each Maikameki is allowed to carry a black fan with which to cover the heart-shaped opening above described, and in this way conceal his or her feelings to a degree. I say to a degree, for I may as well tell you right here that falsehood is unknown, or more correctly stated, impossible in the land of the transparent folk, for the reason that so wondrously clear, limpid, and crystal-like are their eyes, the slightest attempt to say one thing while they are thinking another broils and clouds them, as if a drop of milk had fallen into a glass of the purest water. As I sat gazing at this strange little being seated on the bench there beside me, I recalled a conversation which I had had with a learned Russian at Slovichogotsk. Said he, speaking of his people, we are all born with light hair, brilliant eyes, and pale faces, for we have sprung up under the snow. And I thought to myself how delighted, how entranced he would have been to look upon this curious being born not under the snow, but far under the surface of the earth, where in these vast chambers of this world within a world, this strange folk had, like plants grown in a dark deep cellar, gradually parted with all their coloring, until their eyes glowed like orbs of pure crystal, until their bones had been bleached to amber clearness, and their blood coursed colorless through colorless veins. While sitting there following out this train of thought, the clear white light suddenly began to flicker and to play fantastic tricks upon the walls by dancing in garbs of ever-changing hues, now brightest yellow, now palest green, now glorious purple, now deepest crimson. Ah, little baron, exclaimed Master Cold Soul, that was an uncommonly short day. Rise, please. I made haste to obey, 
whereupon he touched a spring and the bench opened in the center disclosing two very comfortable beds in a few moments night will be upon us continued the mikamenki but thou seest that we have not been taken by surprise i should explain to thee little baron that owing to the capricious manner in which our river of light is apt both to begin and to cease flowing we are never able to tell how long a day or a night will prove to be this is what we call twilight in thy world i suppose day goes out with a terrible bang for our wise men tell us that nothing can be done in the upper world without making a noise that your people really love noise and that the man who makes the greatest noise is considered the greatest man owing to the fact little baron that no one in goggle land can tell how long the day will last or how long it may be necessary to sleep our laws permit no one to set any exact time when a thing shall be done or to exact any promise to do this or that on a certain day for bless thy soul that day may not be ten minutes long hence we say if tomorrow be over five hours long come to me at the beginning of the sixth hour and we never wish each other a plain good night but say good night as long as it lasts what's more little baron as night is apt to come upon us this way unawares by law all the beds belong to the state no one is allowed to own his own bed for when night overtakes him he may be at the other end of the city and some other subject of queen galaxa may be in front of his door and no matter where night may overtake him with the monkey he is sure to find a bed there are beds everywhere by touching a screen they drop from the walls they pull out like drawers they are under the tables and the divans in the parks in the marketplace by the roadside benches bins boxes barrels and barrels by pressing a spring may in an instant be transformed into beds it is the land of beds little baron but ah i behold the twilight goes to its end good night as long as it lasts and with this master cold soul stretched himself out and began to snore having first carefully covered up the two holes in the front and back of his garment so that i shouldn't have a chance to take a peep through him in case i should wake up first bulger and i were right glad to lay our limbs on a real bed although from the way my four-footed brother followed his tail around and around i could see that he wasn't particularly delighted with the softness of the couch End of chapter 7、chapter、eight of Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M.B. in Washington State. Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood. Chapter 8. Good morning as long as it lasts. Plain talk from Master Cold Soul. Wonders of Goggle Land. We entered the city of the Mikamenkis. Brief description of it. Our approach to the royal palace. Queen Galaxa and her crystal throne. Master Cold Soul's tears. I don't think the darkness lasted over three hours. Perhaps it was longer, but Master Cold Soul was obliged to shake me gently ere he could rouse me. Now, little Baron, said he, after he had wished me a good morning with the usual as long as it lasts, tacked on to it, if thou art quite willing, I'll conduct thee to the court of our gracious mistress, Queen Galaxa. Our wise men have often discoursed to her concerning the upper world and the terrible sufferings of its people, exposed as they are to be frozen by the pitiless cold and then burned by the scorching rays of what they call their sun, and she will no doubt deign to be pleased at sight of thee, although I must warn thee that thou art most uncomely, that thou seemst so black and hard to me as scarcely to be human, but rather a bit. Of living earth or rock, I greatly fear me that thou wilt make our peace.